All right, good morning, everybody. It looks like we have reached critical mass. I am gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome uh, to the EBSC Standards Technology Review Workshop. Today is February 15th, 2022, right and early at 9.05 a.m. this morning. So today, to start the workshop, we will go over some logistics. This workshop will be recorded and posted online, and the presentation slides will be available shortly on the EVSC Standards Meetings and Workshop page under the Technology Review Workshop event. To ensure you are receiving all notices for the EVSC Standards program, please subscribe to our email list. The link here will take you to the subscription page. Make sure to sign up for the electric vehicle charging station open access list. We will send out workshop notices and any postings for documents on this list. Okay, moving now to questions during the workshop. We will have a time for an open question and answer at the end of the presentation. During the presentation, everyone will be muted. During the presentation, you may submit questions in the question box on the right. Please indicate the slide number if you want to reference something. During the question and answer time, we will be reading the questions from the box, but we'll allow for audio questions at the end. If that is how you would like to ask a question via audio, please raise the, use the raise hand feature and we will call on you. You may also submit questions via email to myself at stephanie.palmer at arb.ca.gov. Any questions submitted via email will not be answered on today's call, but you will receive an email reply. Now we are going to do staff introductions. Um, Joshua Cunningham will make opening comments. And I, Stephanie Palmer, will be giving the presentation and answering questions today. And then I have Adrian Harris with me to monitor the chat and be the question and answer moderator and technical support if you need it. Joshua, I'm gonna turn it over to you now for some opening comments, then we shall get into the presentation. Joshua. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Can you hear me as a audio check? Yes. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the EVSC Technology Review and the public workshop to discuss our review. Um, the regulation is important to make the charging experience more accessible, essentially making it easier to use electric vehicles and for the drivers to feel comfortable venturing further from their home in their plug-in vehicles. Statewide, as we push to expand passenger vehicle electrification rapidly, drivers need to have a high level of confidence that they'll be able to fuel and uh, find chargers. Otherwise, the use of plug-in vehicles can't fully replace conventional vehicles and we can't achieve our environmental goals. This becomes increasingly challenging as the market expands and a wider diversity of drivers begin using plug-in vehicles, drivers with a wider set of expectations for payment options and convenience. As with any regulation CARB adopts, staff continue to evaluate the impacts on the regulated party and the market. This helps us learn, but also helps inform CARB if changes are warranted to the rules. In the case of this EBSC access regulation, we committed to conducting a technology review of the payment system requirements, recognizing there are costs associated with the implementation of our rule. But by evaluating payment hardware usage and whether the lack of it is a barrier, we recognize there were additional related barriers needed to be studied. We'll talk about our review and the recommendations we're proposing today. We welcome public comment at this workshop and in the coming days through comment letters. Uh, let me turn this back over to Stephanie uh, to get into the details. And again, welcome. Thank you, Joshua. Okay. Today's staff will be going over the technology review scope, methods, findings, recommendations, and next steps. This will be following the order of the report that has been published. Lastly, there will be a period for public comment and questions at the end. Okay, in 2013, 
the California legislature signed into law Senate Bill 454, which is called the Electric Vehicle Charging Stations Open Access Act. Then at the June 2019 board hearing, the CAR board adopted the staff proposed regulation. As part of the adopted regulation, CARB staff committed to doing a technology review. The EVSC standards regulation became effective on July 1st, 2020. This review was not intended to and does not propose specific changes in regulatory requirements, but rather to provide an assessment of access to public charging infrastructure, including the availability and use of different payment technologies and to provide a continuing forum for all stakeholders to keep abreast of the state of payment technology and charging needs. The technology review may inform potential future regulatory proposals along with non-regulatory approaches to increase access and support the ongoing EVSC rollout. With that said, what specific questions did the technology review address? We addressed what barriers do drivers experience when they attempt to access charging? What are the circumstances under which a driver must call customer service when initiating a charging session? How frequently are charging stations down? To what extent have credit card companies deployed EMP chip and TAP enabled cards? What is the availability and use of EMV chip and TAP payment methods by consumers? What are the charging stations up and downtime, and does that affect the needs of drivers? Along with the above questions, staff sought to understand more deeply the needs of the under and unbanked drivers and what payment methods assist in providing access to these groups. How did staff complete this technology review? Staff kicked off the technology review process in October 2020 with a public webinar. This webinar asked for public feedback on the topics that the technology review was going to cover. Along with the webinar, staff engaged with parties in informal meetings throughout late 2020 and 2021. Staff also conducted a literature and data review on the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation or FDIC reports, such as how America banks household use of banking and financial services study, and other financial industry reports about banking. Lastly, staff conducted surveys of electric vehicle service providers, or EDSPs, credit card companies, and of drivers. Eight of 11 EDSPs responded to their survey with varying levels of completeness. Two credit card companies responded to the survey, but did not provide direct answers to the survey questions. The driver survey was sent out via social media from various groups. A complete listing is in the report methods section. The driver survey was also sent via email via various groups. A complete listing of the email list is also in the report in the methods section. The driver survey had a total of 1,290 respondents, 1,175 of which were from California. There are three categories of drivers who responded. There are 761 respondents who, that are plug-in electric vehicle drivers or PEV drivers who use public charging, 259 PEV drivers who do not use public charging, and 155 non-PEV drivers. Of this total, 483 respondents had a household income of less than $50,000 a year which is 41% of the total California respondents. Five key findings arose from the work that staff completed as discussed in the previous slide. We will go over the findings now, then in the following slides, dive into the data that supports these findings. Finding one, inoperable stations and payment issues are barriers for drivers. Two, Membership requirements may be perceived barrier for drivers. Three, multiple payment methods exist on chargers today, but most EVSPs rely on a contactless tap method of payment. 
four, tap enabled cards represent a small segment of cards in use today nationally, but deployment is accelerating. Lower income survey respondents are somewhat less likely to have tap and CARB lacks detailed data on distribution of these cards across California. Lastly, TAP has the potential to expand payment options for under and unbanked drivers, but barriers still remain. Finding one, inoperable stations and payment issues are barriers to drivers. I will be reviewing data from the driver survey. If you want to see the full driver survey, please refer to Appendix C of the technology review. As part of the driver survey, drivers were asked what, if any, barriers they faced when using a public charging station. Drivers were given a range of pre-written answers with an option to write in their own answer as well. Staff grouped similar responses into categories to help identify the most prominent themes. The table displayed shows the results of that survey. Drivers indicated that membership requirements, charging station operability issues, and payment issues are the top three common barriers they are facing. Membership requirements include answers such as not having a membership or not wanting to create a membership, which is one problem the EDSC standards regulation seeks to resolve it will be important to monitor this issue as implementation continues. Finding one continued. The driver survey also asked if PEV drivers who have used a public charging station had ever had to contact customer service. If so, why? Drivers were given a range of pre-written answers with an option to write in their own answer as well. Staff grouped similar responses into categories to help identify the most prominent themes. The table displayed shows the results of the survey. The top three responses, which is 70% of responses, are related to inoperable stations. The fourth, fifth, seventh, and eighth reason are related to payment issues. This grouping of answers is 20% of total responses. Given this information, drivers are saying non-operable charging stations and payment membership issues are the primary reasons why they need to contact customer service. Results from the EDSP survey, though incomplete, tell a little different story. The EDSP survey question was, of what percentage of the EDSP's public charging stations are inoperable over the course of a seven-day period? Four responses were returned and indicated a national uptime between 95 and 98%. The data from both surveys suggests that there may be a disconnect between what drivers are experiencing and what EVSPs are reporting. More work needs to be done to understand this issue. Finding two, membership requirements may be a perceived barrier to drivers. The driver survey also asked PEV drivers who use public charging stations why they created a membership account with an EVSP, followed by how many memberships does that driver have? Drivers were given a range of pre-written answers with an option to write in their own answer as well. Staff grouped similar responses into categories to help identify the most prominent themes. The table displayed shows the results of the survey. 76% of PEV drivers who use public charging stations said they have a membership. Two thirds of these said that they needed a membership to access the station. 62% of respondents have two to five EVSP memberships. One of the key components to open access is to ensure that membership with an EVSP is a choice and not a requirement to use a public charging station. More work is needed to understand to the extent to which membership may be a real or a perceived barrier for drivers. Before getting into this finding, I would like to note a couple of modifications to this table. The modifications spoken and shown today 
will be updated in the final technology review report when it is published. First, Tesla operates a payment method that is a proprietary communication protocol that they call plug and charge. This is different than the other listed plug in charge that uses the ISO 15118 standard. This payment method is included in the other category under the Tesla responses. Secondly, Rivian and Tesla both operate private DC fast charger networks and are therefore not subject to the EDSC standards regulatory requirements at this time. Both of these co companies were surveyed because they have and continue to engage with staff on the subject. Um, third, Rivian does not operate a public, excuse me, does operate a public level two charging network, which is subject to the EDSC standards regulatory requirement. Fourth, ChargePoint does, does accept EMV chip cards via their customer service line, and it can also be stored in their network, network mobile app. At this time, the chip reader is not available on the actual charging station. Their this response is indicated with a single star. Okay, now let's move on to the result. Finding three, multiple payment methods exist, but most EDSPs rely on contactless tap technology. Staff surveyed EDSPs, asking them to list the payment options currently available at their public charging stations. Refer to Appendix E of the report to see the full survey to the EDSPs. Eight out of 11 EDSPs answered this question and the table displayed are the answers. The answers discussed today are not an indication of non-compliance with the regulation. All of the single starred responses, except for the one charge point response that was just discussed, are in limited use or are only on DC fast chargers. The double starred NFC card is a tap enabled credit card technology issued on consumer cards. While there are multiple payment options available, the network providers have predominantly relied on contactless tap technology highlighted by the red boxes, which depends on the contactless reader, which is an RFID reader. Finding four. Tap cards are a small segment of cards today. Deployment of them is accelerating. I will be discussing data from responses to the credit card company survey. To see the full survey, please refer to Appendix D and the technology review. Drivers and credit card companies were asked regarding the deployment of TAP cards. Visa responded that their current TAP market share is 15% nationally. MasterCard responded they estimate TAP market share to be 25% nationally in the next two years. It is noted that none of the credit card companies were able to provide California specific data. In the driver survey, 819 drivers said that they have tap cards. Their survey also asked drivers when they use a credit card for any type of transaction, roughly what percentage of time do they pay by tap as opposed to swipe or inserting the chip. 15% of respondents indicated that they never use TAP. 37% stated that they use TAP 1 to 25% of the time. While a lot of drivers responded that they have TAP, the usage of the TAP feature is not one would expect. The technology has completely penetrated the market. Finding four continued. The driver survey asked all respondents about the payment technologies they have available and use. 83% of California drivers responded to the question, possess some type of payment card. The table displayed shows which card payment technologies respondents possess for two categories. Respondents who earn less than $50,000 per year and respondents who earn more than $50,000 per year. 79% of respondents with income above $50,000 have TAP cards. 57% of respondents with income below $50,000 have TAP cards. 
it is important to note that lower income respondents are more likely to have no payment card at all. As indicated previously, CARB lacks the detailed data on the broad distribution of TAP cards among California generally. The data is reflected of drivers who are generally engaged in PEV activities and took the time to complete the survey. Even among early adopters, the data does not reflect the general penetration payment methods outside this engaged technology friendly group. Thus, suggesting there is a possibility of a broader disparity in access and awareness amongst Californians, including Californians who lack full access to credit. Further work will be needed to explore these issues and is important to consider as PEVs move from an early technology to general use. And finding five, TAP has the potential to expand payment options for under and unbanked drivers, but barriers remain. According to the Household Banking Survey by FDIC, minimum balance requirements keeps drivers who are unbanked, unbanked. As part of the banking in industry has changed, peer-to-peer um, -peer mobile applications or P2P companies are removing those barriers to traditional banking methods by not having a minimum balance requirement. P2P companies are starting to issue cards associated with the user's accounts. Cards that are issued come with EMB chip, tap, and magnetic swipe capabilities. This approach also gives users a card that they can use to pay for goods and services. Payment cards that are issued from peer-to-peer -peer companies are backed by major card issuers like Visa, MasterCard, and Discover, giving the user the ability to use the card at any merchant that accepts those payments. 30% of respondents to the driver survey who have a household income of less than $50,000 annually do not have access to smartphones with contactless payment ability. This disparity appears even among early adopting PEV drivers. Once again, because of the nature of the survey's focus on these drivers, the presence of a disparity even among this group may suggest broader gaps among Californians generally. Not having a smartphone with contactless payment is a barrier to charging in public. More work is needed to understand potential other advantages or barriers that might exist relative to the use of a smartphone for lower income households, such as whether the use of these apps require a data plan or a Wi-Fi access, and the extent of which lower income drivers have data plans and or charging stations provide free Wi-Fi. From all the previously discussed findings and data supporting the findings, staff have five recommendations that will be put forward to the board. Recommendation one, revisit the EMB chip requirement in the EDSC standards regulation only when TAP technologies are more broadly available in California. Based on staff's findings, access to TAP technology is not yet widespread, either through TAP-enabled cards or TAP-enabled smartphones. A higher fraction of PEB drivers have TAP-enabled cards 70%, but 42% of the TAP-enabled PEB, dri PEB drivers never or seldom use that card technology. There is less access to these cards by lower income drivers relative to high income drivers, and survey respondents are not representative of California as a whole. The EBSC standards regulation must be de designed in a way that provides access for the drivers of tomorrow who will be more diverse in terms of their access to and comfort with new technologies. Recommendation two, conduct ongoing monitoring of public charging market trends. A second recommendation is to develop a public website to convey key network metrics and progress, which we will call an EDSC access dashboard. This dashboard could contain data from the service providers 
regarding the status of roaming agreements, network up and downtime statistics, payment hardware supported by network providers, including the number of EVSC that supports the various payment methods, and finally, the use pattern of the payment hardware. Recommendation number three. Continuing evaluating barriers to charging for all users with periodic updates to the board, including, but not limited to, the following topics. The extent to which membership is a real or perceived barrier in accessing public chargers. Market status of credit card companies' issuance of TAP-enabled cards. How drivers are using TAP for purchases, including use of TAP-enabled cards, RFID cards issued by service providers, and smartphones. As part of this, understand barriers and opportunities to using smartphones to pay for goods and services, including extent to which drivers have TAP-enabled phones and have data plans or depend on Wi-Fi, the latter of which is not available at many charging stations. Low-income drivers and drivers who are under or unbanked would be the central focus of this work. Barriers that exist for charging for under and unbanked drivers of PEVs, for future drivers of PEVs. Recommendation four, in conjunction with industry drivers and other state agencies, develop a metrics and pro a process for tracking station up and down time. It is important to have uniform reliability metrics so drivers can have confidence in public charging infrastructure. Recommendation five, Explore conducting a research, research study or pilot project to evaluate how people, particularly low-income residents, pay for transportation services, including public EV charging. Now that we have reviewed the scope, methods, findings, and recommendations of the technology review, let's discuss what will be happening from this point. Staff will consider public comments submitted in the public comment log. The process for submitting public comments will be discussed on the next slide. Staff will present the current um, recommendations at the spring board hearing currently slated for April 2022. Staff is currently monitoring compliance with the current regulation. If the board requests a new regulation, um, a whole new regulatory process will need to occur. Um, part of the technology review process, we have opened a public comment log. The public comment log opened on February 7th when the report was released. There's a 21 day period for comments with the comment log closing on February 28th. This slide contains the link to submit your comments. There is also a link where you can view other comments that have been submitted in the docket. The slides shown today will be posted on the program page in the coming days. The program page is also linked on the slide. Thank you everyone for staying with us this long. We are at the point of question and answer and discussion. In your GoToWebinar box, there is a question section. Submit your questions there. Please include the slide number if we need to go back to the slide to answer your question. We will work through the questions in the box first, then open up for audio questions. As always, you are welcome to receive, uh, submit questions directly to me via email, but note those questions will not be answered during the workshop today. Okay, Adrian, if you are ready, please unmute and we can start going through questions. Good morning. Um, we received a couple of questions asking if the slides will be shared after the workshop. Um, yes, the slides will absolutely be shared after the workshop. Um, they will likely not be posted today in the next day or two. They will be posted and we will um, send a notice out that they are available. All right. Thank you. Um, so one of our first questions is a comment saying you must define uptime. The operators slash company seem to define it as the station is on, e.g. there is power to the station. 
this does not mean the station works and is able to provide the ASP for energy. There are many, there are so many ways it can fail. Uptime must mean able to successfully provide the requested charge without customer service intervention at the level of charge and the time frame promised. Okay. Um, thank you for your comment. Yes, as part of the recommendation, I believe that will be worked on. So um, please stay tuned for those details as they come out. Our next question is, can staff discuss the discrepancy between the technology review topics identified in the October 19th workshop and the questions addressed in the tech review slide seven in the presentation? Yes, um, we uh, as going through the work, you know, technology review process, we had received additional direction um, from our board and um, in parties. And so this is ultimately how the you know, technology review shook out with those directions. Thank you. Um, we had a request for clarification. Many of the EVSC stations have a tap pad, but I believe this is only for membership cards slash apps. I don't know if these same pads accept tap credit cards since I don't have a tap credit card. So can you clarify if the tap pad is the same pad for both credit cards and membership cards slash apps? So that would be um, heavily reliant on which um, network provider you are at. Um, but the because the foundational technology is the same, um, you should be able, that same TAD would, if enabled by the network service provider, be able to use the TAP technology. Usually you can tell if there is like a Visa or like some sort of um, big credit card company logo on there um, that will indicate that it can accept the TAP um, credit card. All right. Um, someone also asked, under the card type, what is a TAP only card? Uh, that would likely be from the driver responses where they have TAP only, and um, which means that all the cards that they have in their wallet um, have tap on it. Um, most cards we understand that have tap have EMV chip, um, but the question was to indicate, you know, if if all the cards in your wallet have have tap or do they not have tap? And we understand that the cards um, have a mix of the technologies because, as we come to learn, um, you know they need to have the backup technology on them as well. So if it's tap only, it just means that all of the cards in their wallet have that technology, but we, but we do understand that they also have the other technologies as well. Thank you. Um, someone asked, what was the definition of a smartphone that CARB used in its driver survey? Slide 16. Oh, um, I actually, do not have the exact wording offhand, but I believe it had um, functionality of a touchscreen, um, can download apps, access to Wi-Fi. Um, and Adrian, I know you helped me develop this. Is there any other feature that I am missing of the smartphone definition? Uh, that's it. We defined it as it ha usually has touch screen functionality can access public Wi-Fi and can be can access a application store such as the App Store with Apple or the Google Play Store. Um, optional is it does have um, like voice command such as Siri with Apple iPhones or um, Google Assistant, but those are not required for it to be considered a smartphone. Thank you. Um, our next question is, someone is unsure what a smartphone has to do with payment. Yeah, um, because 
smartphones are an option to pay for charging and um, they are a key um, feature of you know being a member of a, a network because you can download the app and so um, as part of understanding the universe of payment options um, smartphones needed to be included because it is an option that consumers have to be able to pay for basic goods and services. Thank you. Um, someone had a comment. So is there not a payment method for cash? This will be a problem for many homeless in our communities. Um, per the responses from the service providers, currently nobody accepts cash um, at their network uh, at their stations, um, but your comment is noted. Thank you. Our next question is, can you review the next steps? I believe slide 19, one more time, please. Yes, happy to go back. Okay, next steps. So staff will consider public comments that are submitted on the public comment log. Um, you can also view that comment log online to see what other commenters are saying. Staff will present the current staff recommendations at a spring board hearing, which is currently slated for April of 2022. Staff is currently monitoring compliance with the current regulation. And if the board requests a new regulation, a whole new regulatory process will need to occur. Okay. Our next question is for public charging stations, what are the most used payment options? So as part of the EDSC standards regulation reporting process, we do gather that information. It is a statewide aggregate number of the number of times the specific payment hardware technologies are used. The timing of getting that report is actually gonna be after this workshop. So um, I do not actually have a specific answer for you, um, but as part of the process, we will be receiving that information in the coming weeks. Thank you. Has CARB staff estimated the cost of retrofitting existing EV charging stations with credit card swipe readers? Um, yes, as part of the um, initial regulatory process, the estimated cost for um, DC fast chargers was for a retrofit. And that unit was estimated um, to be at $370. Um, for L2s, the estimation was actually for a complete redesign because we know that there's um, going to need to be some fitment involved. But that unit that would be included would also be roughly um, the same cost. Thank you. Um, we have a comment and a question. Tap is the future, whether credit card or smartphone. Ask the credit card companies and banks, do we build for the present or incorporate the future? Uh, CalFresh provides EBT cards. The state may at some point provide similar cards for charging. Um, I am not familiar with those programs, but I will um, take your comment under advisement. And um, thank you very much. And we look forward to um, understanding those programs and how they could integrate better. Yeah, and Stephanie, I can mm -hmm. add more to that too. Um, appreciate the comment. We fully recognize that TAP is the growing area for payments uh, and could be the future but we need this regulation to ensure that we're growing infrastructure support for drivers now. Um, so as we've noted in the next steps that um, we may end up changing the regulation at some future point um, if we determine that the, the chip systems are not necessary, but for right now we really need to make sure that we're 
growing infrastructure that supports um, the emerging market and a diversity of driver needs. Okay, thank you, Joshua. Um, the next question is, have you defined membership? I'm interested in understanding what constitutes a membership. For example, is it just submitting an email address or having to pay a monthly fee? Yes, um, a membership was um, defined as just creating a, a basic login with an email address and a um, password. Um, and that's how it was um, put forth in our survey. Thank you. Our next question is, has there been investigation of the aggregator role in enabling subscribers to access chargers? um is that in reference to um like roaming agreements and whoever asked that question if we could clarify um yes we did um take a look at that um industry is making um active connections as we speak um for which is um good to see yeah and stephanie maybe you could just elaborate mm -hmm. on the benefit that roaming can provide to expand network access? Yes, it enables, um, roaming enables drivers if they want to have a membership with company A, that if that particular company has connection agreements with um, other networks, they can go and use the other network on that same um, company's membership, whether it's through the mobile app or their RFID card but they are able to expand their um, driving area without having to create another membership. So it benefits them by getting, gaining access to other, um, a greater number of EDSEs. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Um, beyond the CARB survey, what targeted effect, effort has CARB made to specifically speak to these groups, in particular organizations that work on financial inclusion? Reference page eight, understanding needs of under and unbanked drivers. Yes, the first step with us um, was to target, um, to complete the targeted surveys, um, but as part of moving forward, um, staff would like to develop um, greater relationships and um, working sessions with um, this, is, yeah. So this is also an area we want to do further work as indicated in the recommendations so that, that will be expanded upon in the future. All right, thank you. Um, someone asked, did the survey address pricing of electricity as a potential barrier? Um, do not remember if I had a specific pre-given answer um, for that pricing was too high or unclear. Um, but there were written, there were two written in answers that um, drivers had indicated that the pricing of public charging was too high. Yeah, and Stephanie, I can add to that too. Mm -hmm. You know, we recognize that that the cost of electricity for charging infrastructure can seem high and is high to some drivers. Um, as we've done separate analyses, separate from this rulemaking, we do see that there are savings for EV drivers, though, compared to gasoline. Um, but the price of the electricity is important for the charging companies to ensure they can recoup their investments. Um, and um, certainly want to encourage home charging that is cheaper and have separate policies to enable that. But pricing is, given all those complexities, pricing is outside the scope of this tech review. All right. Thank you. Um, our next question is, one of the barriers to adoption of EVs is that gas car drivers don't see EV charging stations in their communities. EV drivers sometimes can't find them easily as public EVSE is rolled out. Can it include integrated visible 
from the road signage, this can be part of public awareness funding. Yes, um, under, understood. Um, unfortunately, uh, public public directional signing from the road is um, outside of the scope of the regulation. Um, but as part of trying to ensure that there is a um, good repository to find, you know, charging stations in general, um, there is a requirement for all of the network um, networked EVSE actually I think and non networked EVSE to be located on the alternative fuels data center um, stations locator. So that um, has a robust location, uh, robust location um, for all the EVSE and it also includes information about pricing and um, what payment technology is available and the number of EVSE. Um, so we are uh, trying to tackle that within the bounds of our um, availability for this um, program. All right, thank you. Um, on slide 10, the 121 respondents indicated finding a charging station was a barrier and 39 a lack of charging station availability. These responses would appear to indicate that the lack of public charging station availability is not an issue. Can you comment? Did you ask about the extent to which drivers charge at home versus charging from public EVSE? Um, per the survey, I think we only asked if they had ever used the public like charging network at all and then um if so i think how often and then but we did not include the converse um, of do you charge at home um so home home charging was not um, a focus of this because it is outside of the scope of the regulation um, and the tech review Thank you. Um, we have another question. Did the survey addressing other potential barriers such as safety or security of charging sites, usability of the equipment, access to amenities including Wi-Fi, etc.? Um, no, I believe those are not pre-written answers um, and actually I do not even believe the written responses that were received from drivers um, indicated um, those were issues at top of their mind. That is not to say though that isn't an issue and that um, drivers do need to see that. Um, but for the scope of the technology review and what we were trying to learn um, from drivers, we restricted um, pre-written answers and to um, you know payment considerations and what they are saying um, today as a, as a potential barrier. Um, so that, um, yeah. Right. Or, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I know the majority of EV drivers repeatedly experience trouble using DCFC and worry of if this is not addressed quickly, new EV drivers will return to gas cars. There seems to be a complex problem. There seems to be complex problems driving this lack of reliability. Are there engineers being consulted to begin to understand how to better these chargers to function at an acceptable uptime? Mm -hmm. um, so while the process to learn about reliability and um, the functions of that has actually just started taking off. We are working in consult with um, other state agencies. Um, I do not know if there has been a specific meeting with engineers, but I will say that we are, um, that will be a part of the process to ensure that reliability is um, tracked uh, correctly and to develop um, proper metrics in concert with um, the technology. 
thank you. Um, did CARB use independent researchers to design this survey? No, the surveys were developed um, by staff and um, management at CARB. Our next question is the rulemaking analysis also found that EMB chip cards are as secure as contactless cards because they both use the same security standards for transactions. Did CARB consider skimming and shimming fraud schemes which target the magnetic strip when the card is inserted into an EMV chip reader? The FTC has shown this to be a risk for EMV chip card usage. Um, yes, we are, but my understanding is that that security risk has dramatically diminished with the EMV chip uh, usage and how the information is um, conveyed. And so while it is a concern, and especially because we do not um, require the magnetic stripe, um, we are aware of it, but it's um, the security flaw of an EMV chip reader does not seem to be insurmountable. I thank you. Does CARB know what percentage of people in California rely solely on prepaid debit slash credit cards and what percentage of these individuals are looking to transition to EVs? Um, no, I do not have that specific data. All right, our next question is, seems to me the obvious best system is the plug in charge where EVSC is told what account has plugged in, in and the payment process all occur, occurs seamlessly and effortlessly. Why is that not the main recommendation? Um, well, there are uh, a couple of reasons, but um, mainly of which our uh, enabling legislation um, had the t had the wording of um, credit card um, mobile payment or both. And so we are following the enabling legislation. Um, also, you know, plug and charges um, while plug and charge DC is developed, um, waiting for AC to be developed and um, have that whole system. So we are supportive um, of the plug and charge technology um, and are very excited to watch um, the future unfold with that. Okay. I believe you stated that all the EVSP rely on one contactless payment method, NFC reader. Is this technology failing to, ex to accept payment? If so, are there new top technologies under development? Um, it's not that the RFID reader or the tap reader is um, failing to accept payment. It's that the a good chunk of the multiple payment options relies on that particular reader. And if that reader goes down, my understanding is all of those payment methods that which the consumer could choose from would um, not be available at that point and they would have to switch to something else that they may not have or may not want to use. And so um, more research is needed in this area to understand, understand if there's going to be new technology developments. All right. Um, someone asked, there are also regulations from DMS. Are there any plans to harmonize CARB and DMS regulations? Um, I work really closely with um, DMS staff. Um, we have um, harmonized as much as we can on timing um, and our, um, our different requirements. They are bound to follow handbook 44. Um, if there is a specific component that is um, causing some strain um, in the industry, um, please contact me and let me know. Um, we will obviously work with um, industry and staff at DMS to see where this would be at. 
but I um, understand we should be okay at this time for both implementations. All right. Um, someone said that there are so many other problems with stations. The charging hoses don't reach the card. The screens are impossible to read when the sun shines on them. They need a sunshade. Um, the hoses don't release the car when charging is finished. The station cannot take a credit card, even though it takes the card. And the list goes on. Are you going to examine those issues? Again, if the station does not deliver the charge, it is useless to the driver, no matter the reason. Mm -hmm. um, understood. Um, part of what uh, the issues that you have identified um, will likely be research in other um, program areas, either at CARB or likely the Energy Commission. Um, we are aware of these, these issues and will take steps to um, ensure that they are uh, reviewed properly um, in the proper program. Unfortunately, the EVC standards um, doesn't, ex these sorts of issues, um, except for the credit card one, um, are a little out of scope for this program, but um, we try and communicate across agencies to make sure they are being addressed. All right, um, we have another question. How did CARB determine that EV drivers who responded to the survey are more technology friendly? How does CARB determine that technology friendly has an impact on the knowledge of payment systems? Uh, reference to, I believe, slide 15. Yeah, so the um, the surveys were spent, or spent, my apologies, sent out via, um, you know, incentive programs that work with um, low income groups to get them into new technologies. They were also advertised via social media on um, like CARBS, CARBS Facebook and Twitter, other state agencies uh, forwarded that as well. So, um, Traditionally, the people who interact with those um, social media websites are a little bit more technology friendly or are curious about moving into the um, zero emission vehicle space in some form or the other. So it was just a matter of how they got sent out. All right. Um, has CARB estimated the annual maintenance cost of credit card readers? Um, there's no specific cost for the annual maintenance of a credit card reader because um, that was assumed to be wrapped up in the traditional maintenance that was involved with a normal EDSE. They can do the site visits at the same time. All right, thank you. Uh, someone asked, is there a requirement to retrofit EVSE with EMV chip readers or only new EVSE? Correct, we are not requiring a retrofit requirement. The regulation as it stands today is as of January 1, 2022, all new installed DC fast chargers must be compliant with the, with the requirements. Um, and I'm gonna only speak to the payment hardware there are other components involved, but they must be compliant of the mobile phone and the credit card reader requirement. Then as of July 1st, 2023, level two EDSC, again, newly installed after that date, must be compliant with the payment hardware requirements. Thank you. Um, again, I just want to flag this as another question that came up. Um, costs to retrofit seem very low. Has CARB explored recently? Can you survey firms to validate costs for retrofits? Um, as stated, we do not require retrofits. Um, we expected um, units to be new and um, that can be as part of the um, ongoing work 
Um, Joshua, do you have any comments you would like to provide? Yeah, I'll add a little bit. Stephanie, after I share my quick comments, if you could just pull up the final deadline that we do have. But um, mm -hmm. we anticipate that chargers will have a, a, um, a lifespan that will lead to eventually um, upgrades at each site as the chargers age. And so we anticipate that the providers will um, then ensure those sites are up to the requirements at the time that the chargers age out. Mm -hmm. um, so with that in mind, we do have a later date farther down the road in which all chargers installed have to meet the requirements. And so Stephanie, if you could just help clarify that part. Absolutely. So we understand that the useful life of an EVSE L2 or DC fast charger is roughly 10 years. So as part of the regulation we've put into place as of July 1, 2033, all existing stations that are in the ground prior to the January 1 and July 1 dates will need to become compliant at that time. So that is an anticipate that is anticipating a natural turnover or um, if the unit within that normal lifespan had to be um, uh, turned over because of like unnatural circumstances. So by 2033, everything should become compliant. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. And we, that was a, that was a, an important discussion and stakeholder engagement during the rulemaking itself back in 2019. And so that later date was a, a consideration we took seriously about not wanting to put undue cost burden on the industry in the early years but recognizing we wanted to have some deadline in which everything was uh, new and used were um, providing the payment harbor requirements. And so that was the, the balance we, we put into the requirement. All right, um, someone else is asking about public DC fast charging, saying public DC fast charging is expensive. How can you make EV charging at reduced rates available to low income individuals? I just wanted to flag that comment for this webinar. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your comment. Um, uh, that work will be completed um, I believe, as Joshua indicated earlier, in, in other programs, there are ongoing studies um, regarding that. Unfortunately, that is outside of the, you know, tech review and the EVSC standards. Um, but your comment is noted, and um, staff will continue to work with other programs to ensure that it is reviewed properly and, and, and worked on. Uh, someone asked, are there additional charges for peer-to-peer -peer payments. I have heard that there are privacy concerns, articles on public expo exposure of payment lists. Also, aren't there additional fees to use peer-to-peer, -peer, which would impact low-income drivers? Mm -hmm. um, that's a very good question. Um, in our research, um, the there are low to no fees associated with a peer-to-peer -peer account. Um, you can usually um, sign up for one for free, um, providing some information that is traditionally needed to open a traditional bank account, but not always, which we understand is another barrier um, for some groupings of people to share um, more private information. Um, so, more research is uh, needed within the peer-to-peer -peer, um, space, but um, preliminary research has indicated that it is a um, good and viable option to help um, the low and under and underbanked get, gain access to um, a more traditional banking method that can issue them a card um, and, you know, uh, digitize cash in an easier fashion. All right, thank you. We have a question on slide 10. What has been done to investigate or solve the number 
the third reported barrier too expensive that drivers experience at public charging stations, especially for lower income drivers. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this program does not exactly address the specific cost of electricity of at a public charging station. Um, this program does adjust um, notifying the consumer of like the cost of charging so they can see that when they um, drive up to the station. Um, the specific cost of charging um, is actually being worked on in other programs. Um, I believe Joshua, you have indicated that previously. Um, but I uh, staff, um, you know, work with other staff, not only within CARB, but other agencies to ensure that topic is at the forefront of people's minds. Um, Joshua, if you have anything to add. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Um, yeah, you said it well, I'll elaborate with some of the other programs. We're very aware of um, a large amount of state investment and federal investments in infrastructure um, for um, EV charging that helps bring down the capital installation costs for charging companies that receive those state or federal funds to um, help subsidize the equipment. Um, and we would hope that leads to reductions in the prices that the electricity is charged on site. So that's one way the state and the federal governments are helping to enable, enable the infrastructure uh, investments and contain costs. The second one that we're aware of is that generally for any electricity distribution system, um, the CPUC oversees the rates uh, for, for um, homeowners, residential and commercial properties, commercial properties for public charging. Those rate setting efforts happen at the CPUC with utility proposals um, under SB 350 uh, for transportation electrification. There are specific proceedings um, to evaluate what the investments would be. Uh, by the utilities and they're able to rate base that and hopefully spread out the costs over a long period of time to to minimize the cost increases. But generally, those are outside the scope of this particular regulation. And we certainly, as Stephanie said, as Air Board staff, uh, want to work with those other agencies to convey the challenges for lower income drivers on those prices. All right, um, our next question is in the survey, it says there may be a disconnect between what industry is reporting on uptime and what drivers are experiencing. Besides the question on why a driver contacted customer service, was there a specific question on network reliability or was this indicated as part of the other categories drivers could write in for the survey? Was there any distinction between public level two and DC fast charging in sites in the survey on this topic or generally? Yes. Um, so no, um, there was no distinction between DC and L2 um, the, for the focus of the tech review and the, um, the EBSC standards in general. Um, the requirements we treat L2 and DC as the same uh, because consumers need to access it in the same fashion, even though we understand that their dwell times are different. Um, the pre-written answers um, were of like charging station not working, but um, also drivers had the ability to absolutely um, write in their own um, responses. And again, those were, um, you know, looked at by staff and categorized appropriately into the same group. So um, if they indicated that the vehicle connector, you know, um, or some version of that, it was grouped together. So hopefully that helps. All right, um, our next question is, can you talk more about the public access database with up and downtime statistics? When do you expect to have this designed and up and running? Um, yeah, there's no uh, current date uh, set for that. Um, this is a um, 
starting of the idea and we need to see if the board is going to adopt it. Um, but I would anticipate it. Um, this is, you know, staff speaking to be attached to the program page um, and be a, a fairly static um, updated, um, you know, item um, from numbers that we would receive. Um, Joshua, if you have any other insights into timing, um, that would be helpful. No, I think you said it right, Stephanie. This is an important recommendation and we want to um, present it to the board and, and then have a discussion with them about what they feel is the appropriate timing. Mm -hmm. All right, our next question is, has CAR been working with or looking at Cal ITP's effort to install TAP and pay systems on California's transit agencies? Yes, um, staff have a connection with um, Cal ATP. And we are, we are working to learn about their program and see um, potential areas for overlap um, because it is, a, it is an important and needed program and the work that they are doing. All right, um, we have another question related to cost information and timeline. Um, the technology review states that the preliminary new cost information indicates the hardware installation cost may be lower than staff estimated in 2019 and that ongoing networking fees may be lower. Can you please discuss more specifically what is the timeline for completing a review of this new cost information? Will the staff update its economic impact analysis? What information could be helpful for CARB on this topic? Um, Joshua, you can correct me if I'm going to overspeak here, but my understanding is that we will not be updating our economic impact analysis. So the SERIA will not be modified because we are not in a regulatory process. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, mm -hmm. We do not have plans to do ongoing cost assessments of the hardware systems. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly would like to learn uh, about the evolving costs of the installations, um, but that's not part of what we're um, currently doing or proposing going forward. Mm -hmm. Staff is, as always, um, ready and willing to listen to, you know, um, any and all stakeholders. So if you have new information, um, you know, please set up a meeting or send it over. Um, we are open to receiving um, communication from stakeholders. All right, um, someone asked, can you expand on the progress toward a universal public EV SE access solution? What has been done and what progress has been made? Yeah, uh, so per, per the boundaries of the open access um, enabling legislation, um, the the universal, um, <clears throat> excuse me, access solution um, currently as it stands is what, what do people have in their wallets, which is um, their cards and um, their, their phones. And so we uh, obviously, or the card board has obviously adopted a rule in that fashion, um, you know, as time goes on if there is a you know new technology or um you know something that will be more universal that everybody has access to that they're you know remove more barriers um you know carb will be monitoring that as part of the ongoing program work um, but that is where we are today all right um someone asked were lower income drivers more likely to have to charge in public more often? Um, referring to survey question 3C. Um, Adrian, I know you actually um, probably read that a little bit closer. Do you by chance have that information on hand? Uh, I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but one thing that we observed was that um, there were more lower income drivers among 
PEV drivers that have not used public charging stations. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, our next question is of the current public DC uh, charging station that have credit card reader devices on them, has CARB requested data on the percentage of charging sessions that are initiated via swipe or inserting of credit card? I believe that was part of one of the questions that was submitted to the um, service providers and we are um, anticipating um, information on the annual payment reporting um, metrics, or, excuse me, the annual payment report that is a part of the EDSC standards regulation as it stands. All right, our next question is, is the survey experimental design available, the survey instrument itself and answers to every question? Um, we used um, Microsoft Forms and know that the specific data to the survey is not publicly available, um, but the details of the number of responses and who it was sent out via the social media and emails are within the method section of the report. And each of the questions are also in appendix in the appendices of the report. Um, I do not believe um, there are plans to, you know, publish um, the raw data. Um, Joshua, you can speak to that if I have um, misspoken. No, I think that's right. I think we've done a, a a robust job of providing the survey questions, like Stephanie said, in the tech review appendices and aggregated the data for the trends, but we would not want to release individual responses from a privacy standpoint. All right. Um, our next question is, has CARB analyzed the reliability of NFC versus EMV chip reader? Um, that was actually, I believe, not a question in the survey. So, um, no, I believe that was not. All right. Okay. Um, we have another question based on your survey. 70% of drivers have access to TAP as compared to 11.6% with only EMV. How can you conclude that TAP is not widely available and recommend EMV? Um, so yeah, while we do not have um, specific data to um, California, like specific data as a whole, um, we are still showing that there is um, a slight disconnect and um, because the numbers nationally are, are different from what we're seeing here. So more research is to be done in um, that area. Um, Joshua, I'll let you go ahead and add to that. Yeah, I think a couple of other things to add, you know, the market is growing rapidly at this point. And so 70% is a, a large number for the current PEV drivers, but as the market grows, we're entering into the phase of more diverse uh, drivers. We wanna make sure that we keep an eye on it uh, and that we're not cutting off a hardware payment system that a lot of the newer drivers entering the market might wanna use. Um, I would also say, Stephanie's mentioned a couple times that relying on the NFC reader as one hardware device for the majority of payments that would be on the contactless side has some risks uh, connected to the reliability issue. And so that is also something we wanna keep studying as we've mentioned in the recommendations section. So for those two reasons, we think it's premature um, to remove the uh, chip reader. All right. Um, our next question is have you considered some form of mandatory reporting by all EVSPs regarding charging station uptime, downtime, and the full range of issues they faced? Um, yeah, that is a, a recommendation that we have definitely put forward um, and that will uh, not be a sole CARB um, project that will be jointly done um, 
with other state agencies. So um, stay tuned on the details, but um, that that idea is there and it will be a um, big process overall. All right, um, someone asked, will any agency be responsible for ensuring cost of charging has a cap as not to end up where fuel cost is today? Um, so I'm not exactly sure if any one agency is uh, is currently in charge of like the public pricing of the fueling cost for um, PEBS or electricity as a transportation fuel. Um, a cap, um, my understanding, has not exactly been discussed, um, though uh, each, some of the agencies have, can touch it in different ways, as um, Joshua has indicated previously, um, you know, CPC has the ability to work with um, rate programs with the utilities, um, and, you know, CEC works with that um, through, you know, some fun funding programs and that type of stuff. So. Um, no cap, as far as I understand it, have been discussed, um, but your comment is um, noted. And the topic of paying for um, the cost of electricity as a transportation fuel is um, being discussed with, amongst the other agencies. All right, our next question is, is CARB working with the CEC to ensure that all new funded public EVSC and fast chargers will comply with CARB's regulations. Yes, absolutely. Staff has a connection with those with their programs. Um, we're in um, good communication, um, and um, my understanding is um, most of you know CEC funding requirements uh, state that you must be in compliance of um, you know all state laws, per lack of a better wording group. Um, so. As part of those um, funding programs, you, you do need to be compliant with the rules that are in place at the time of um, installation. All right. Um, our next question is, why are the very legitimate and real challenges of unbanked and underbanked individuals a burden for EVS and site hosts to address rather than the financial service industry. Um, they would like to know if we are looking at this broad issue myopically or regulating in the wrong, less efficient or cost effective space. We are attempting to take a holistic approach. Um, it is not one person's problem distinctly or another, or not person industry. Um, but rather as the vehicles move in, you know, from the early technology phase to mass adoption to, you know, that's different markets, second, third hand markets. Um, it is imperative that we keep in mind um, that as, you know, as a public charging, you know, station, it is a public service. And so it absolutely has to work for everybody who has those vehicles and the people um, who are going to have those vehicles because the market is anticipated to expand so quickly that the investments being made now need to be able to work into the future for everybody um, for the you know expensive vehicles the lower less expensive vehicles for all drivers um, so we're just trying to you know work with as many as people um, or industries as possible to make sure that we are capturing you know California drivers needs as a whole um, to get them to help make this transition as we need to um, meet our, our goals um, for emissions and climate change um, priorities. Uh, Joshua, if you have anything to add on that one. No, I think you said that well, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, our next question is how often will CAR be will study the payment technology trends and payment methods and report back to the public and the board? Um, yeah, that is um, going to be developed in concert with um, the board at the moment. The, um, it's just uh, consistently. So, um, Joshua, if you have any other um, ideas as to the timing on that, that would be helpful. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we've clearly committed to this technology review and plan to present to the board um, this spring. 
you know, for any of our regulations that the board and staff implement, we do ongoing evaluations of the market and the technology issues, but we don't typically have a defined timeline in which we come back to the board. It's usually um, staff's judgment when we think that there are challenges and then we recommend that rules be um, reviewed and, and, and updated to the board. So we're not going to make a commitment on specific frequency of ongoing technology reviews. All right. Um, our next question is, will the use of different payment systems associated with automatic load management systems for multifamily housing, EV charging, apartments and condos, and the variety of potential payment issues be included in your ongoing studies? Um, if not, how will the EV drivers of these EVSE be protected? It's a very good question. Um, so if those particular units, um, I believe you identified it to be like in an MUD or an apartment situation, if those units are considered public, um, then they would be captured under the regulatory efforts of this program. Um, if they are private and are restricted for the use of um, you know, residents only and they're signed appropriately, they are not automatically captured into this program. Though, um, as always, staff does um, want to hear of any issues that are being, um, you know, had at these units. And um, while may not be able to address them specifically in this program, we'll be able to share the information with other agencies and other programs that may have um, better authority over that. Um, you know, load management, uh, flexible charging is gonna play a huge role into our future. And so we need to make, sh you know, make sure that drivers have easy access to that and um, payment wise and for their vehicles. So um, it will be an ongoing work but likely not necessarily through this particular program. Uh, someone asked a clarifying question. Were Tesla superchargers considered public chargers? No, they are not. Um, the Tesla supercharger network is considered a private network. They're um, as defined by our publicly um, available EDSC network definition in the regulation. They are, um, they are currently private. All right. Um, someone asked a question, a clarifying question on the process. Is the tech review and workshop not under a regulatory rulemaking, but rather informational? How could the board take any of the rec recommendations mentioned in this report? You are correct that this is an informational update, um, but as part of that, in the part of the um, April board hearing, there is um, time for public comment, um, and also staff will be, um, you know, taking the public comment that is submitted in the comment log and summarizing it and presenting that. Um, Joshua, did I capture the um, process well for that? Yeah, it's common for staff to have informational updates to the board to keep them appraised of rules and, and implementation. It's also common for board members and the board as a whole with the resolution to direct staff to take action um, either on ongoing analyses for implementation. So that could be a recommendation or request to staff or to open a rulemaking and um, consider changes to a rule. So that both of those are common outcomes from informational items uh, outside of an existing rulemaking timeline. So if in the case this spring, if the board directs us to make changes to the rule, then we'll start a rulemaking. Thank that's you. not currently what we're proposing, but that could be an outcome. All right. Um, someone asked how often will CARB track reliability of fast chargers to track improvements or lack of improvements? Yeah, that will be um, developed along with the reliability work that is undergoing um, amongst the agencies. Um, so if you have a specific recommendation, um, please send it and it will be shared. 
amongst the staff who are going to be uh, working on that. Okay. Um, let me scroll back up here. Um, we did have a couple of more questions related to our economic impact analysis that I just want to be aware of. Um, does CARB's original economic impact analysis assume for cost information a single unit for NFC and EMV? Um, if you're talking about specifically the payment hardware, yes, um, it would be a, we anticipated the unit to be, um, you know, capable of both um, because that is um, what seems to be most common um, today. But we did acknowledge and have a flexibility within the regulation that it does not have to be on every single EDSE, um, you know, sites or depending even on the um, network provider, if they so chose, um, they could implement that payment hardware requirement on a kiosk. So you could potentially have a, you know, a bank of chargers with a single kiosk that you could use that payment technology on. Um, so hopefully that helps. All right, thank you. Um, due to time, I wanna hop over really quickly for audio. So if anyone wants to raise their hand and ask any questions, please get in the queue now and we can begin with that. But we did you wanna, go ahead. But I did just want to point out um, a couple, someone had just a workshop question, wanted to make sure that we were going to publish a transcript of today's workshop, particularly the question and answer period. Um, so there will be um, no transcript, like um, how the CEC provides for their workshops. Um, but we are currently recording um, the audio and the visual presentation um, in GoToWebinar. And so as soon as we are able to make that um, in compliance with our accessibility um, requirements, we will be publishing that to our website um, that has not stopped recording. So you will um, obtain the question and answer section via that recording, um, but it will not be published in a transcript form. Okay, um, just scrolling back up. We did have a couple of just general comment. Um, someone said we must meet people where they are today. As an example, veterans benefits, social security and SSI disability payments are all paid out on the direct express debit MasterCard, which does not require a bank account. Uh, this is an EMV chip card and does not have tap and or contactless capabilities. Um, Thank you very much for your comment. Um, that will be taken into consideration. Let's see. Um, someone else mentioned the ISO 15118 plug and charge would slash will be good, but legacy and most existing vehicles lack this capability. Yeah, we under, we understand that there are cars on the road today that do not have that capability. Um, but my understanding with um, working with industry who has developed the standard, um, not only on the vehicle side, but also the charging, um, the charging station side, um, no vehicle would be precluded from um, receiving a, you know, a charging session at a capable, um, you know, charging station. Um, that being said, they just would not have, you know, the the functionality of just being able to plug in your vehicle and walk away. Um, 
because they the the cars that are out now um, that do not have that capability don't have the um, the hardware the chipset that is needed. Um, but the good thing is is they're not precluded from charging at any public charging station that has that functionality. All right, we do have someone with their hand raised. Um, I'm gonna unmute you, Cesar Diaz, and feel free to ask your question or make your comment. Okay, hello, good morning. Can you hear me now? I can, thank you. Okay. Uh, Cesar Diaz with ChargePoint. Um, just charge point would like to thank carb for conducting a uh, the tech review in response to the board's action so um just a couple of i guess questions uh regarding kind of a couple of focuses that we think that the tech review did not um that needs additional investigation on number one is regarding the the lack of low income ev driver data um one of the key reasons cited in carb decisions to mandate an emv chip credit card reader was to provide universal access to electric vehicle supply equipment. Unfortunately, the fundamental questions still remain unanswered. What is the estimated population size of Californians who are unbanked, underbanked, and low-income EV drivers currently? For EV drivers that identify as, as such, how do they charge their EVs now? Um, and how do they access public electric vehicle supply equipment? Um, and lastly, how do they purchase other goods and services that require a credit card payment? Is the method of payment the largest obstacle? These are just some of the questions that we think need to be further evaluated. Um, ChargePoint supports a tech review's recommendation to conduct a research study or pilot project that evaluate how particularly low-income uh, residents pay for transportation services. We do believe, though, that this technology review should have incorporated that data since it's been something that's been in the works for 14 months. But nevertheless, we recommend that um, staff be able to provide a timeline and proposal to the board regarding that information. So I'll, um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll pause my comments there. I'm not sure how many other folks are in the queue, but uh, thank you again for your, your time. Thank you, Caesar. Um, your comment is noted. That looks like that is all we have for audio car for audio comments. Excuse me. Um, we. Did uh, oh, um, oh, go ahead, Adrian. It looks like Kelsey um, Johnson. I'm going to unmute her once I find her. She has a question, and then uh, I found her. I can unmute her. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, Kelsey. Thank you both. Uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, Kelsey Johnson with Rivian Automotive. Um, thank you, CARB staff, for um, noting the updates that um, were going to be made to the next revision of the reports as pertaining to Rivian earlier in the discussion. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to further clarify Rivian's current product offerings on the verbal commentary. We we'll also plan on um, submitting some written commentary as well, uh, in addition to just offering two quick um, points of feedback as well on the tech review. Um, so as many folks know, Rivian's a California headquartered all-electric vehicle manufacturer um, but in addition to that our vehicles in addition to our vehicles we're also building out two charging networks as stephanie noticed uh, noted earlier the rivian adventure network which is currently for rivian drivers and then the rivian waypoints network which is open to all drivers with a focus on enabling all electric trips to state and national parks uh, currently rivian has waypoint stations installed in two of california's most iconic parks yosemite and golden gate national recreation area all of which those stations are currently free for drivers to use um so in terms of the tech review um did want to thank this, the carb staff for the work on it um, as providing a good first step towards providing some of the data that they that to answer the industry's questions about how to best serve these low-income underbaked and unbaked communities now and into the future uh, the two points of feedback that we'd like to offer um, for staff consideration between now and April um, are that we'd like to encourage staff to commit to and prioritizing additional um, statistically significant surveys specifically focused on low income, underbanked and unbanked populations regarding the technology payment trends that they use overall, not just for transportation. I think the overall is an important piece to get a full picture of what those communities are using regularly. 
Um, second, we'd also like the staff, we'd also like to encourage staff um, to, to make a concrete commitment to an annual reassessment of the payment technology trains, uh, trends, excuse me. So both the charging industry and the payments industry are aware of when additional data will be needed to inform the further decision making on this topic. Um, recognize that this is not a typical uh, status that staff does based on comments uh, made earlier, but based on how quickly this top technology is evolving, um, we believe that it does merit a bit more of a structured approach and transparency in terms of when things will be revisited. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment and uh, we look forward to continuing to discuss and work with CARB on this important topic. Yeah, I'll jump in, Stephanie. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, we are not going to make a commitment for a specific frequency at this point of the technology and financial payment systems review. But as we've said, we take that quite seriously and we do, we are proposing ongoing work for data collection, uh, public release with dashboards and um, studies. Um, we'll present it present that to the board in the spring and um, reassess at that point on what the next frequency we can commit to is, but we're, we won't commit to that at this point. Um, thank you, Joshua. Um, Adrian, do you wanna do um, uh, Lori Mott and then Christian and then Jay for the hands? Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, not seeing Lori Mott with her, okay, there it is, apologies. Um, go ahead, Lori. Thank you. Um, this is Lori Mott. I'm with Cool the Earth and uh, Ride and Drive Clean. We are a collaborative organization of EV drivers, nonprofits, uh, local governments, and, and other entities trying to promote, um, transitioning to EVs. And as such, we've had a lot of experience uh, with EV drivers experience with public charging. Um, great technology report, um, very informative. Um, uh, I wanna call attention to the rather astonishing and perhaps not in a good way, disconnect between 70% of drivers reporting inoperable stations and only four EV SP uh, reporting uh, out of 11, reporting that they had 95 to 98 um, percent uptime. That's that's a big problem and needs some investigation. And I would specifically say that with all the federal and state investment about to arrive for EVSE, I, I would urge CARB and the Energy Commission and any other state entities, perhaps the governor's office, to ensure that there are um, enforceable standards to achieve reliable uh, performance of EVSE, including maintenance, um, because that is clearly an issue here. Um, I'd also suggest that if the grants are made, I realize this is a little bit outside the scope of the technology review, but I wanted to get this point out there. If there are grants made for the capital installation of these projects, that perhaps the final payment of the grant be withheld until there is compliance with the reliability and maintenance standards. And we will be submitting comments to the comment portal. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your comments. I look forward to seeing the written um, one and, um, and thank you for participating today. All right, um, we have Kristen Corby. Um, I'm gonna unmute you so you can make your comment. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thank you uh, so much for this uh, great workshop today and fielding all of the diverse questions that uh, that you got. Um, there's definitely a, a lot of interest in this, uh, uh, this regulation and this update, um, and for good reason, um, because as, as you've addressed and I think done a really good job of discussing, this is a really delicate balance between being able to provide access uh, to all uh, people in California for EV charging, but then also keeping the hardware requirements 
uh, not too burdensome to make charging uh, too expensive or place too much of a burden on uh, the kind of um, growing EVSP industry uh, right now. So I think you've you've done a very good job of of trying to balance that and um, and a focus on on the future of technology, which does appear to be uh, the tap card. It almost seems like um, like the the chip <laughs> the chip readers are already going out of style, and the tap is is taking over. Um, so. Uh, with that, I really do appreciate the the great uh, um, emphasis that you've that you've placed on on emerging technologies. I think that's really important for the industry. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to uh, say that um, uh, Cal ETC. I'm uh, I, I can't even remember if I said my affiliation. I'm it's, I'm with uh, the California Electric Transportation Coalition, uh, the deputy executive director, and I've been working with uh, some of the. Uh, Pacific Northwest utilities on doing some analysis of their uh, uptime uh, for the chargers and within their service territories. And they've done um, some really robust analysis on uptime. And I, so I just recommend, um, uh, you know, using me as a resource, using CalHTC as a resource, and um, I can connect you with uh, some of those um, utilities in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm sure there's also been some great work done um, in Canada and in Europe and across the United States. So I'd, I'd make sure to uh, widen our literature review and review of, of some of the usage um, to beyond just California. And uh, and just to that note, we are, um, you know, we're anticipating a regional charging network in California that will um, promote uh, EV travel uh, throughout the state and beyond and having um, uh, some uh, some connection to the other states and their payment requirements, or at least an understanding of what they are, um, in order to make uh, things uniform as uh, as EVs uh, begin to travel beyond our, our state borders, I think is a, an important eye as well. Um, so uh, thank you again, and uh, really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much for your comment. It is um, noted, and I look forward to seeing um, the you submit. Um, looks like we have Natalie that has her hand raised. Yes. Hi, sorry, there may be a confusion with the naming, but Dilan Jaff on behalf of the Electric Vehicle Charging Association we thank you and your colleagues from CARB for conducting an electric vehicle supply equipment technology review. As a newer industry, it is essential for EVSPs to work closely with CARB and other state agencies to ensure all stakeholders understand the evolving technology trends that EV drivers are using. EFCA believes in report, the report's preliminary findings are an essential and initial step for CARB to understand what policies, programs, and regulations it should undertake to assist in development and deployment of robust EV charging infrastructure across the state. Nevertheless, we believe the technology review findings left three topics unaddressed. One, the reliability of different payment methods. Two, differences in security between EMV chip readers and contactless NFC payments. And three, the impact EMV chip credit, uh, sorry, EMV chip credit card readers will have on the cost of EVSC, specifically level two chargers. Our association will be submitting a more detailed letter where we address these issues further and seek clarification from CARB to better understand your findings. And we look forward to working with you on this topic in the weeks to come. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. All right, next up we have Susanna Saunders. I'm gonna unmute you. Hi, my name is Sue Saunders, and I'm with the Marin EV Sonoma Squad. We're an EV advocacy group and have many uh, members with significant expertise on electrification of transportation. And some of the concerns we have are um, affordability for all income levels. The current DC fast charging is equal to about $4.40 uh, per gallon, which is you know not going to it's going to create a significant cost barrier for many drivers um, and also 
we are very concerned about the reliability of the fast charging network. And our suggestions would be that there be a escrow account required for money, any money given to these charging companies. And it's a very complex system. And I understand, you know, we understand that, you know, it's a complex system that is being rolled out, but currently uh, the stations are very unreliable and very frustrating for many drivers um, that we have surveyed. And so I'm, I'm, I would like to suggest that there be new regulation added that a separate escrow account be and money be set aside specifically for maintenance and as for budgeting for maintenance accounts it is really common to budget two to five percent of replacement asset value annually for maintenance costs and the default value many use is three percent and this gets adjusted up or down based on the type of equipment but our concern is is that if this money is not set aside that the maintenance will not be done and it currently seems that the maintenance times to get back up uh, inoperable chargers is not acceptable. And it's gonna frustrate many drivers and we're not gonna be able to make the uh, transition to electrified transportation if we have people who cannot use the chargers and experience significant frustration. So I hope you will consider that. And I wanna thank you for doing this review. Um, you know, Prior to this, there really wasn't a review of current um, uh, operability of chargers and uptime. And this really needs to have significant study. Um, so I thank you so much for doing this survey and bringing attention to the significant problem with the reliability of the chargers. Thank you. You're welcome. Just Stephanie, I'll, Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, so thank you for your comment. Um, we as you've seen here today, note that there are reliability issues that we feel we do need to study. And as Stephanie said, we'll work closely with the Energy Commission as we jointly explore that and better understand it. Um, uh, your comments on the escrow accounts are valuable ideas. Unfortunately, we will not be able to do that type of a requirement. Um, as a state agency, we would need specific statutory authority to do financing type requirements like that. Um, but I would encourage you to uh, engage in other proceedings on the incentive program. So federal, state, and utility investments in chargers, they may have the opportunity to stipulate maintenance requirements where there are public funds involved. Um, so certainly encourage you to take those ideas to those programs. We will not be able to act on it, but I appreciate your comments. Okay, I'm just gonna do a time check. We have about four minutes left in our slotted time. Um, Adrian, it looks like we have two comments to address in the questions box, and then we will um, potentially close the webinar shortly after that. All right, um, one of the questions was, what are the main causes of EV charging station downtime, not just maintenance, but what is breaking? Mm -hmm. So um, I can say that, you know, staff does not have a um, very clear view of specifically what is causing the downtime. Um, I think that it is, is calculated differently in, in every circumstance. Um, but what we are aware of is that drivers said that, you know, they walk up or they drive up to the station and it's down and they also experience um, the vehicle connector being broken. So um, what causes the you know, station to be down is um, something that we are going to work with other state agencies to um, learn and to uh, potentially um, calculate you know, in a finer tuned area um, as part of the reliability effort um, and work with industry to understand what they see from their side as well. But the two that we're aware of right now is that the unit itself is down and that the vehicle connector um, is obviously broken. So, but thank you for your uh, question. And then do we have one more from Jay by chance? Um, I do not see a comment. Let me check to see if he raised his 
and uh, oh, I actually think I found it. Okay, if you're okay with me reading it. Um, yeah. Uh, Jay Jay Friedland said, "Thank you again for today's workshop." So should the legislature also take up the pricing or price gouging issue specifically with the DC fast charger? Um, Joshua, I'm actually going to toss that one up to you and not um, wanting to overspeak on the process of, you know, recommending to the legislature. Yeah, um, appreciate the comments. Yeah, we as staff and the Air Resources Board, we will stay neutral on whether specific new legislation should be proposed. We will react to uh, bills as they get proposed. But um, yeah, that's not our job to kind of advocate for a specific bill. But appreciate your engagement, Jay, and look forward to your ideas. Um, we have one minute to spare. Adrian, I'm gonna ask if you see any other new questions at this time. Uh, I, uh, just Jay asking, is CARB the appropriate regulatory agency? Uh, for what topic? Uh, pricing and uptime. Um, not exactly sure if that's one for us to determine, but Joshua, you may have um, a better response. Yeah, I think, like I said earlier, we're not going to make a comment on the on potential proposed bills and um, whether A or B would be directed to do something as compared to a different state agency. Um, mm -hmm. We do uh, feel we want to study reliability and uptime as Stephanie has conveyed today and, in, and we would put into the technology review. So that is something we're going to observe, monitor, and work in partnership with CEC, but we'll, um, uh, we'll make any comments on, on legislation. Okay, and with that, we are a one minute over our time. I want to thank everybody for participating in today um today's online workshop um as always it is um uh, wonderful to interact with everybody um i am also available to meet with you regarding any questions or concerns you may have um this is my email contact and my um phone number um it will not change again um many of you know my phone number turned over twice in the year um but please utilize it. Um, I am here um, as staff to work and um, listen to everybody. And at this time, this concludes the workshop for the EBSC Standards Technology Review. And I look forward to seeing you all at the April board hearing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.